Good morning. Uh, welcome to this week's residential lecture. Um, I'm happy to present Dr. El Haj. He's a second year resident at our department and he will be giving you an insight into what to do with adrenal masses. Enjoy. Good morning. I have the pleasure to talk to you this morning about adrenal incident telomas. Now, what are they? They are asymptomatic adrenal masses that are found on imaging that was performed for a different purpose. Now, I'm going to begin with a question to my uh, resident colleagues. How frequent are they? Could anybody tell me? Around 5%. Well, very good, uh, very close guess. Studies from Fasnacht have shown that up to 8.7% of patients actually have an autopsy series, an adrenal incidentaloma. So what I want you to remember is that they are common. Now let's have a look at the anatomy. You certainly know that they are localized in the retroperitoneum, on the left side in relation to the spleen and the tail of the pancreas, and on the right side, the liver and lateral to the vena cava inferior. Concerning vascularization, we have three arterial branches, a superior one coming from the inferior phrenic artery, a middle one comes out straight from the aorta, an inferior one that comes from the renal arteries, and then where there is a difference to note is for the venous backflow, where on the left side it drains into the vena renalis sinistra, whereas on the right side it goes straight into the vena cava inferior. Now, this is important to note, particularly for the surgical approach. Now, adrenal glands are actually divided into two parts. You have the cortex and the medulla. The cortex itself is again divided into three. We have uh, the zona glomerulosa, responsible for the secretion of mineralocorticoids. Zona fasciculata, producing the glucocorticoids and then the reticularis for the adrenal androgens. The medulla is, uh, has a different embryonic origin and is responsible for the production of catecholamines, so epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, when you have an adrenal incidentaloma, you have to ask yourself two questions. Firstly, is there a hormone activity? And secondly, is it malignant? Now, another question to my colleagues. How many percent of adrenal incidentalomas do you think are hormonally active? Uh, I'd say about 15%. Okay, that's a very good guess. Actually, it is just a little bit higher. It's around 25% have a hormone activity and around 17% are malignant. Now, you might wonder why is that important to know? Because these are the indications for surgery. Now, how do you assess malignancy? Well, on one hand, you have the re radiological criteria. You can look at uh, the Hounsfield units. In a non-contrast CT, anything that has a H uh, Hounsfield unit below 10 is probably going to be benign. And as you also look at the washout on contrast CTs, which have an absolute and relative washout, or respectively four, 60 and 40%, are going to be most probably benign. Another criteria is size. Size matters. This study from Sturgeon in 2006 has shown that the, the bigger the tumor, the higher the likelihood ratio of it being uh, malignant, which goes up to 27 for tumors of 10 centimeters or more. Now, to give you a little bit of an over, overview of the distribution. Around 60% are non-functioning adenomas. We have 8% that are non-functioning categorized as other tumors. 5% are metastases. Then we have 10% cortisol-secreting tumors. 2% aldosterone-secreting. Few chromocytomas encounter for around 7% of tumors. And then finally, adrenocortical carcinomas with around 8%. Let's take a deeper dive into the hormone active <coughs> tumors. The Conn syndrome. You all certainly remember the RAS system that is responsible for the regulation of blood pressure. Well, when you're facing 
a primary hyperaldosteronism, you have a tumor in the adrenal glands that is producing too much aldosterone. Now, what is that going to do? Well, in the kidneys, you will have a reuptake of sodium, inducing an intravascular volume expansion, so a higher blood pressure, as well as an excretion of potassium and protons, inducing hyperkalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Important to note is that in a Kahn syndrome, you have high aldosterone levels and a low renin because there is a negative feedback system behind this. So how are you going to do the diagnostics? Well, these patients will have an aldosterone to renin ratio that is going to be above 20. And in your lab works, you will find hyperkalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Now, the symptoms of these patients are going to be dependent on these two signs. So the hypertension is going to induce the headaches, and uh, hypokalemia is going to be responsible for muscle weakness, paresthesia, such, and polyuria. What I want you to remember today is that when you have a patient with hypertension and hypokalemia, always think of a Kahn syndrome. A study from Aronova has actually shown that up to 18% of patients that have hypertension actually have an underlying Kahn syndrome. Now, for the algorithm of therapy, once we've done the diagnosis, you want to know, is it unilateral or bilateral? Imaging is going to help you with that, but that's not enough. You'll have to perform an adrenal venous sampling. And if it's going to be unilateral, we will most probably go for a surgical approach. And if bilateral, do a, give an adductone to the patient. Important to note, is that two-thirds of patients actually have a bilateral disease. Now, the Cushing syndrome. The hypothalamus is responsible for the secretion of CRH that is going to induce the secretion of ACTH in the interior pituitary gland. And in turn, the zona fasciculata uh, is going to produce cortisol in the adrenal glands with a negative feedback action when the system works well. Now, in adenomas, we have an overproduction of cortisol and a very low ACTH due to the neg negative feedback. So in your lab works, you'll have low ACTH, high cortisol, and the diagnostics can be done with a dexamethasone suppression test. You give the dexamethasone, next morning you take blood, and what you will see is that ACTH levels are going to be very low, but the cortisol production is still going to be there. So low ACTH and high cortisol. You certainly have all, remember all these uh, images of patients with typical Cushing symptoms, such as the moon face, buffalo hump, uh, red striations, and of course, all the cardiovascular uh, problems that go with it. Now you wonder, why do we operate these patients? Well, this study from Delivanis has shown that there is actually an improvement in the cardiovascular risk factors of patients that undergo adrenalectomy for hypercortisolism. Now, let me talk about pheochromocytomas. These are catecholamine-secreting tumors in the medulla. Are around 15% of them are malignant. And for the symptoms, it's easy. Just take the three first letters, P-H-E, of pheochromocytoma, these patients have palpitations, headaches, and episodic sweatings. Now, you certainly heard about the 10% rule. Well, that 10% rule is actually not so true anymore. Recent studies have shown that actually, as we just said, 15% are malignant, 15% are actually bilateral, 20% are extra adrenal, and for the two others, the 10% rule. Still, it's still true. <laughs> now, for the diagnostics, if you have a plasma-free metanephrine that is above three times the upper limit of normal, you're facing a pheo. Once you know that, you want to do a radiological assessment for localization. And once you localize the tumor, you go for adrenalectomy. <laughs>
Now, androgen tum producing tumors, what you have to know with these is that they are rare, but mostly malignant. Here you have a uh, typical example of a patient that underwent virilization due to an androgen axis. And here it's very clear, um, you have to perform an adrenalectomy. What you have to measure here is gonna be the serum DHEA, testosterone, and the ketosteroids in the urine. Which brings me now to the adrenocortical carcinoma, which is a very rare but aggressive tumor. It encounters in approximately one to a million patients, has uh, metastasizes in the lungs, liver, and bone, and its symptoms are actually due to the tumor size and their, its hormonal activity. Fasnacht has shown that you mainly find hypercortisolism and androgen tum producing tumors in ACCs. You classify them through the NSAT staging system. From one to four, one and two is a local disease, one, the tumor below five centimeters of size, two, above five centimeters, three, you have lymph node involvement, and in four, you have distant metastases. The survival rate is actually very poor, particularly in uh, high stages, such as NSAT three and four, as you can see in this, in this study. Now, adrenal metastases. The primary tumor is usually lung, colorectal, breast, and pancreatic tumors, cancers. The indications are gonna be dependent on tumor entity and tumor stadium. Now, for example, if you have a patient with a colorectal cancer and a metachronous single metastasis, it would actually make sense to perform adrenalectomy in these patients. Now, you also might wonder, what's, this, what's the place of biopsy in incidentalomas? Well, actually, we don't perform biopsies unless it is a metastasis, because then there's, an, there's, a, potential, there's a potential indication for it. Here's a quick recap of the algorithm. You wanna know, is there hormone activity, yes or no? You wanna look at the size and know if it's malignant or not. If these two questions or one of those questions is answered by yes, you will go for surgery. Now, in order to illustrate today's case, today's presentation, I wanted to talk to you about Mrs. K, 49-year-old patient with diffuse abdominal pain that underwent ultrasound and MRI and where we found an adrenal mass. Now, uh, once we found this adrenal mass, there was a more in-depth clinical history that was taken from the patient. And we found out that she actually had irregular heartbeats, high blood pressure, headaches, and a weight loss. So here you might think, well, this is probably your FIO. Hormones were measured. We saw that the uh, plasma-free metanephrines were above three times the upper limit of normal. So we had our diagnostic, FIO. Now, let's go back. This patient has a hormonal activity, so she clearly has an indication for surgery. This leads me to the surgical options. Laparoscopic approach is the gold standard because you have a less operative time, you have less bleeding, and the hospital length of stay is shorter. But the open approach still has its place, particularly in adrenocortical carcinoma and tumors that are bigger than 10 centimeters. You might wonder why. Well, when removing an ACC, what is important is that the capsule remains intact and that is much more likely with an open approach than, than laparoscopic. You can see in the study on the left side that the disease-free survival was much better, was, was, was higher, sorry, in uh, the open approach in comparison to the minimally invasive approach. Now let's compare retroperitoneal versus laparoscopic. When you go retroperitoneal, you have the advantages of having a direct access. You can perform a bilateral adrenalectomy without having to reposition the patient. And with patients with uh, multiple previous abdominal operations, you don't have the adhesions. And now the disadvantages are gonna be, of course, the inverse anatomy, 
the greater learning curve and patients with, uh, that are very obese are not good candidates due to the lack of space. Now for the perioperative management in Cushing, remember, you will have to start a hydrocortisone substitution in order to prevent a Nadison crisis. In the Kahn syndrome, do, uh, you have to go for electrolyte correction and blood pressure treatment. And in FIOs, very important, you have to start preoperative alpha-adrenergic blockade. That will prevent a hypertensive crisis during surgery. Then we have also a cardiovascular workup that is recommended. Now, what I want you to remember is that for the perioperative management, always have an endocrinologist on board. This brings me to my take home message for today. Remember, incidental omas are common. 25% are, are hormonally active. 17% are malignant. And that is important because these are the indications for surgery. And if you have an adrenal incidental oma with suspected hormonal activity, I would ask you to do an aldosterone to renin ratio, measure the potassium, perform a dexamethasone suppression test, measure the plasma-free metanephrines, and remember, generally, biopsy has no place in adrenal incidentalomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation. Really fantastic. Thank you very much. It's uh, for us. I mean, it's good to regularly think about that because I have to say we forget that. And uh, it was very internistic presentation. And I like it because here patients are referred to us with a mass, not for all that. So I think, of course, we need to have down the endocrinologist to order with us. But it's important that we uh, understand how we are doing. So I think it was a really excellent summary. I would just ask maybe Diana to give us uh, an overview here. What is our, for example, our approach? Do we use the robot for that? Do we do laparoscopically? Or maybe a comment about this very didactic presentation. So um, we use normally the laparoscopic approach. It goes very well uh, with the same amount of incisions as with the robotic. So we, we don't see the major advantage there for the robotic, but uh, of course it can be performed like that. Um, we also do the, we have, have done the retroperitoneal. I think that uh, has its place, especially if you do a bi bilateral because you don't have to reposition and especially in adhesions as uh, our young colleague just told us. Um, I think it's important to say about the size, you know, you would say, should we do laparoscopic or open? It's really, uh, if you have a very big, um, it doesn't have to be an HCC, but if you have a big tumor, all you want to do is you don't want to ruin the capsule. And if it's very big, laparoscopically or minimally invasive, it can be difficult to really um, avoid a capsule tear. And that's why really there, there's still an, uh, um, a role for the open approach. And especially in the adrenocortical carcinomas, where this is crucial for the survival of the patient. So I think um, an early open approach is, is, is still, is still uh, very good. Yeah. That was perfect. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.